Bertrand Gorge of Cross Knowledge for taking us through M learning, mobile learning and putting it to work. Over to you, Bertrand. Thank you very much, Donald. Uh, do you hear me correctly? I can hear you and yes. you're coming out okay. over the sound as well. Thank you very much and good morning to you all. Um, this uh, webinar is about M learning and putting it to work. We will uh, firstly tell you a little bit about cross knowledge, uh, where I am product manager. Then we will talk about M learning. What is M learning after all? And why um, M learning or e learning on mobile could fail? And then uh, I will try to give you some uh, some uh, practical hints about how to. Uh, to, to, to put M learning to work actually to, to find a usage for, for M learning. Um, so first, uh, a little bit about cross knowledge. We are a training company with more than 2.5 uh, million uh, users in more than 20 countries. Um, it's one of the European leaders in distance learning today. And we sell uh, management and leadership content, uh, SaaS learning suite, and Mohive, uh, which is a SaaS learning content publishing solution. Uh, here we are. So first, um, I'd like to together use thoughts uh, to start with. Um, I'd like to, to ask you if you could ask the, the, the chat area um, why, what are the reasons uh, you would consider mobile learning in the first place? Why uh, are you interested in, uh, in using these new devices for, uh, for, for, for learning? And, and it's a good question, isn't it, Bertrand? Because after all, we talk about it a great deal. It's a fabulous buzzword, but the why question sometimes gets left out. Plenty of answers coming through already. A lot of the anywhere, uh, anytime accessibility. Billy pointed out carbon footprint, so reducing travel. That's interesting. Um, volume areas for manual development. Mm. People working in the field, so it's necessary to actually get out to where people are and help them learn on their job. Flexibility, says Roxanne, wanting to be able to adapt and perhaps do things faster. Uh, shift working, so when people are working perhaps uh, late during the nights or whatever. <laughs> David just says it's 2013. For goodness sake, we have to keep up the speed. Reinforcement, says Peter. I think that's an interesting point, uh, Bertrand, the idea that uh, you can use mobile in conjunction with other delivery methods to ensure that people are nudged, kept up to speed with what they've learned elsewhere. So lots of different reasons there for considering mobile learning. Bertrand, what do you think? I think it's very interesting and um, it, uh, it makes a point to, to having this webinar right now because <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. it's always interesting to, 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 to see why we're doing things. Um, and uh, I actually, I, um, I thought about this webinar myself because um, I've, there has been so many articles recently uh, in the press, uh, in, on the internet, stating that M-learning is going to be uh, a major trend, a very big trend. And um, but I thought to myself, all these statements basically uh, are based on figures like this one, which uh, basically says that uh, everybody is having a smartphone now, which is good. Uh, as uh, David said, uh, I we are in uh, 2013 now, and uh, it's time we uh, start using um, the, the devices uh, our users have. Um, but somehow, uh, there is some kind of a link which says because uh, everybody has a smartphone now, then everybody is going to do M-learning, which I found a little bit quick and uh, to, uh, I, I just wanted to, to, to go a bit further and see uh, if, uh, if there was really a direct link between smartphone usage and M-learning. So um, I went back to the definition of M-learning, one that has been given to us by Bersin uh, in uh, March uh, a, few, uh, a few weeks uh, ago. 
And Bersin says basically, M learning is about just in time and just in place uh, learning and performance uh, uh, enhancement. Um, no matter where they are physically located and so on. So we are exactly where uh, all the reasons that uh, you've been given in the chat uh, at the moment. And uh, well, it's very nice. So um, let's see how uh, how it works. Just uh, a side note: I'm not going to talk about performance support right now uh, because I'm focusing on learning. It's of course possible to do performance support on a mobile phone and uh, on a tablet, but it's a different question. I will try to, to focus on the learning here. Um, so uh, what M-learning is not, on the contrary, M-learning is not about uh, touch enabling e-learning or removing flash from e-learning because the iPad or the iPhone just uh, can't manage uh, using flash. Uh, just a side note on the iPad and the tablets in general. Um, tablets are different from iPhones. They share the same operating system, they, they share the same technology, and therefore they have the same limitations, like the fact that there is no flash. But besides the size of the screen, they are different. And one of the big differences uh, that we have between iPads and phones is that you don't have your iPad always on you. You don't always have your iPad when you are in, uh, in the tube. And um, in fact, the usage of the iPad and the usage of your smartphone is completely different. So um, we will try to uh, make sure we don't confuse the usages between iPads and iPhones and tablets and smartphones because if we do we should uh, be aware that we are going to do some things that may not be used the way we want. I'd like to ask you another question. When you ask yourself about doing M-learning, did you actually target a given device? Uh, a given device? Did you think, okay, I'm going to do M-learning, so I'm only going to do smartphones? Or are you going to do tablets? Or um, did you actually target anything that uh, can't play Flash? So the question is not about M-learning, but more about HTML5 or things like that. And, uh, and, and, and why, basically? Again, it's a really good question because we talk very blithely, don't we, about mobile learning as if it was one generic thing. But of course, there's a wide range of devices people can use, and we've got we've got different things uh, coming through. We've got people talking about uh, about iPads, but also about uh, phones. Um, the use of QR codes working with mobile devices as well, of course, which is which is interesting. Um, and gosh, a wide range um, uh, iPads being used in class. iPads seem to be, and tablets seem to be the winners at the moment. And there's a good question here, which we'll pick up later on, uh, Bertrand, which is where do you start with your design? But <laughs> that was one of the questions I anticipated was going to come out. Uh, generally, I think here, looking at it, people are talking, aren't they, about iPads and tablets with, with some phones as well. Um, what's your reaction to that, Bertrand? It's very interesting. It seems that um, when we talk about M-learning, we, we are more about um, a technical issue. The fact that uh, the iPad has a touch screen and can play Flash. So uh, we have to move to other technologies like HTML5. And, um, but in essence, we are uh, still doing e-learning as uh, we have always done. And uh, we don't change the usage. We are just migrating the technology from Flash to HTML5 mm. in some way. That's interesting. And, um, and it's, um, it does not mean, actually, that there is no uh, possibility to do M-learning, as in mobile, as in smartphones. And, uh, but before uh, one thing that uh, is going to do that, we should really 
see how the usage is going to be on the smartphone. We will talk on the, uh, about the iPad as well uh, a little bit later. So, uh, but just before, I'd like, uh, so before we move on, um, I'd like to show you some figures that I gathered on the web um, in multiple st studies that have been uh, uh, published very recently. One of the studies uh, that you can see here is um, about the fact that um, most users of iPads, uh, tablets, and phones, smartphones, uh, do actually use their smartphone in uh, th at the same time they uh, watch TV or uh, do another activity in front of another screen. If you watch TV while you tweet or while uh, scrolling on your Facebook uh, Facebook wall, then you are like nearly 90% of the users who spend more than uh, one hour and a half uh, on a stick with your smartphone screen, basically. It's quite interesting to see that the smartphone screen is most of the time used with uh, another screen playing uh, or on the computer in front of us. Another figure, which is quite interesting, is um, how uh, wha what activities we uh, we have um, we are doing on uh, on a smartphone. This is typically smartphone. Um, these are minutes. So we see that uh, browsing the internet is the the biggest activity, obviously, uh, on a smartphone. Uh, way before uh, actually placing calls, which is in fifth position, and um, and we spend an awful lot of time uh, on social networks, uh, playing music. Uh, most of the time, actually, we can play music while uh, checking social networks. We play games, of course, and we um, interact with others with uh, emails or text messaging and so on. That's interesting because if we think that uh, if we want to do some m-learning, then our m-learning activity has to fit in this, uh, in this jungle, basically. And uh, one even more interesting thing is that we don't spend 25 minutes browsing the internet in a row. It's uh, very scattered. It's uh, very splitted. And most of the time, uh, one activity, like placing call or uh, browsing Twitter or checking Twitter, only takes uh, 5 to 10 seconds, and then we move on to another activity. So uh, it's uh, very important to, rem to, to remember that when we are going to produce a new learning activity for uh, users of smartphones, it has to fit in the same um, kind of uh, very quick uh, switch of activities that uh, they have that they used to have uh, on on smartphones. Users used to have on smartphones. Another interesting figure shows that, um, and I was actually surprised about this figure. Um, we don't spend that much time on our smartphone at work most of the time spent with our smartphone is at home and at home in front of our TV. We obviously spend quite some time with our smartphones in a tube or while we commute, um, hopefully not while we are driving. And uh, while we are at work, um, sometimes we use our smartphones during meetings, which is not always very good as well. Um, the question here that I'd like to uh, ask you, actually, is when you start doing mobile learning, when would you expect people to actually do these activities? Do you expect them to do it at home or uh, during uh, the spare time while they commute or at the office uh, having a cigarette break, for example? Do you actually target uh, a specific time in a day for uh, for your activities? Very interesting question, Bertrand. And I, I very much like the way we're looking at this from a slightly different point of view to how we often uh, tackle mobile learning. So far, a lot of the answers to this question um, are around the user choosing. So. Um, 
we've got gosh, sorry, it's all scrolling up so fast I'm, I'm, I'm quite <laughs> difficult to find it home or at work says Martin at different times people work differently commuting as long as they're not driving while commuting again says Kate um, and surely there's a lot of emphasis here on it being up to the user to choose when they're doing it um, some people say well when they're working from home um, I, I, I'm getting a real feeling from this that it's a, people are people are saying it's when it's right for them now they're particularly they particularly have a need for it they particularly want to uh, find out something so they'll go and they'll go and drill into it will says perhaps tongue-in-cheek in meetings I'm not sure if that would get the learning and development department the kudos it deserves um, so what do you think Is it, are these the answers you were expecting Bertrand Yes, actually, uh, the answer from Michelle is very interesting. She says, sometimes my students find it easier to complete a quiz uh, on, the, on the mobile as they have issues getting access to a PC, mm. um, which is also something that uh, can be found in the following study, which... Um, which shows basically that if you don't have the choice of your device, then you will probably use uh, your mobile to browse the web, while uh, the more you can, uh, the, the, the more devices you have access to, um, the, um, uh, the, the, the more you will select a device or another given your activity. Here you see that in Egypt, they use very heavily their mobile phone to, uh, to browse the web, and the reason why is that uh, their internet coverage is very bad and most PCs that they have at home uh, doesn't have ADSL so they can't connect to the internet using the PCs so they use their mobile phone. While in the UK or in Russia um, we have internet access on our mobile phone but also uh, on our desktop at home and at the office. So when we decide to actually do uh, an activity on a desktop and not on the mobile on the mobile phone, or when you dec uh, we decide to do the uh, the opposite, it's definitely because we find it easier to do it uh, on a given device. For example, this study shows that um, if you want to check the weather, you will probably uh, do it on uh, your mobile phone more than uh, on your desktop, uh, while if you decide to buy a product or buy a service, you will probably prefer to uh, use a desktop uh, or a, a laptop uh, instead. So the thing we see here is that uh, our users actually choose the device they are going to use depending on the activity, if they can choose. Obviously, when you are in the tube, you can't choose because you only have your smartphone with you so you will use your smartphone and uh, actually it can be quite frustrating because you would like to do things uh, with your smartphone and uh, you, def uh, you find out that uh, the internet coverage is not that good and uh, it doesn't work that well but so what we see is that obviously smartphone usage has exploded it's not uh, it's, it's obvious um, but that does not mean that we are uh, having uh, a revolution, uh, a name learning revolution, when we talk about smartphone uh, usage uh, for the learning. Um, and it's quite obvious that if you ignore the usage, uh, it's going to be very difficult to meet your users. If you decide to do uh, e-learning activity but you haven't thought at all how your your learners are going to uh, to actually do it, when, and how much time they are going to have to do it. You will probably have very poor results on uh, on your uh, M-learning projects. You should be very careful about the iPad. Learning on iPad should meet a need. It should you should not do learning on the iPad just because it's trendy and because it looks cool to do uh, an activity on the iPad. If your users have the choice between an iPad and a desktop, they will prefer to use their desktop to do uh, a complex e-learning uh, product. And uh, actually, that's a point of view, but I quite uh, believe that desktop will remain 
a tool of choice for most employees to do their job and um, it is quite probable that uh, if uh, you target If you do that, if but you send an email... Hold on, can I hold you for a second there? I yes, don't know if it's my laptop, but I haven't got... We've got a lot of people saying the sound has gone. Uh, the oh. sound is playing here for me. Okay. I think, I think something happened with your internet connection there, and I think we've now synchronized. Looks, looks like we had a, an issue there for a second. Ah. Everything might have shut down. Anyway, um, I think... We are back in the room. Okay. Do you hear me then? Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. So um, I was just saying, if uh, you send like uh, an article a p by PDF by email, the good thing is that your user will be uh, will have their uh, article uh, in their uh, inbox while they check their email in the tube. And the first thing you do when you uh, when you sit in the tube is actually check your email just before you check Twitter or Facebook. So if the first mail that you have is uh, a quite interesting article about uh, the topic you are actually uh, learning uh, in the meantime, um, you might actually open the PDF file and start reading it in the tube. It's uh, it's very it's very cheap, it's very efficient, you don't have to do uh, an app for that, and it works. And I see that some people in, uh, in the audience have done uh, things with PDF, and uh, PDF learning we, co we could call that, it's very efficient. <laughs> um, we found that um, very few apps are actually used on smartphones. Uh, a lot of people download uh, download a lot of apps, but at the end of the day, only a few apps remain used uh, by uh, by most users. And among these apps are the social networks and the email and uh, things like that and the games. So if you want to meet your users, meet them where they are. And our users are on Twitter and Facebook. So what can we do with that? We can create a Twitter account one by a topic that uh, you are trying to uh, teach to your learners and um, advertise this Twitter account to your learners. And then when they, are uh, when they are following you, basically they are following a training, um, just publish every now and then uh, interesting videos, facts, uh, FAQs, and uh, let your learners actually click on the links that uh, you, uh, you, you give to them. The good thing is that it's still very cheap. As you can see, we don't sell anything here. <laughs> Everybody can do it here uh, very, very, very easily. And, um, and the good thing is that uh, it will be seen by your learners. It will be seen. As if you do a nap, the, the chances are very uh, high that uh, a month or a couple of months after the, your learners will have downloaded the app, uh, they will s stop using it just before, uh, just because they don't find a usage for it or forget about it. So if you want to do an app, 
a good thing would be to build a game. Because when you are in a tube, basically, or when you are at home, you are tired, you have difficulty focusing, you have to check for uh, where you have to uh, take off and so on. You want to relax. So if you have to choose between an LMS and a game, chances are high that uh, you will probably choose a game. That's, uh, that's the way it goes. So um, if you can, try to reconciliate both worlds and do a game that uh, actually teaches something to your learners. Don't do it too complicated, do something simple. And uh, with uh, some chance, we, you will meet uh, your learners and actually uh, find something useful to do for them. You can use remembers as well, reminders, sorry. Um, like an, invita an invitation that you send using your usual calendar accounts and things like that. And uh, with a link to an interesting article or video. Um, so uh, just send a reminder uh, f every, every evening at 6, uh, at 6 p.m. Um, and when your learners will be in the tube, they will have a pop-up on their mobile phone saying, hey, did you, uh, d did you think about uh, your learning today? Did you actually uh, do something about your, uh, your training? Don't you want to uh, check this uh, link, which is quite interesting, and so on? If you have to do something with tablets, and I saw that uh, a lot of you uh, are actually targeting tablets, Make sure you know which tablets. If you have to target everything, uh, be very careful. iPad 1, for example, and iPad 2 have different capabilities. I don't talk about Android, but versions are numerous and the capabilities are very different. Sometimes you have a video that will work on Android, but not on the iPad. Uh, you may do an HTML application that works on the iPad 2, but not on the iPad 1, and we've gone through that uh, at Crossing Edge. Use a proper tool to build your content. Um, the complexity of doing uh, an HTML app for iPad is very high. Don't underestimate it. And, um, and let uh, the software editors deal actually with the complexity because otherwise you are going to spend a lot of time trying to stabilize your content, uh, dealing with technical issues while your added value is on the content. Use videos because videos work well. They work in every screen size and um, it's much easier to do a video that works well than an app, that, uh, an HTML app that works actually well. And know the technologies. Um, for example, on the iPad and iPhone, you have a technology which is called HTTP Live Streaming, HLS. Uh, which should be used if you want to stream videos uh, on the iPad or on, uh, uh, on an iPhone. So uh, make sure you know the technologies before you start actually targeting these devices. What about on-the-go users? The definition of uh, Bersin just before. What, what we think is that these people uh, mobile workforces, sales rep or maintenance people, they actually do need uh, everything on their device. They don't need a streamed down version of a desktop, they need a real PC. And uh, what we see is that most of these people are actually turning themselves uh, to, towards Ultrabooks, uh, the new uh, very light uh, but still very powerful PCs that are just real PCs but so light that it can actually be used uh, in, the, in the wild. So if they use that, uh, you don't have to do anything. They, they will just be able to do e-learning like every, everybody else. So, uh, so it will just work. And I'm done, basically. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to discuss that with you. Plenty of questions coming up as we went through that. Uh, thank you very much. And this is part of our, uh, our policy of trying to keep the, the presentations interactive and as uh, sort of provocative as possible, so we generate lots of thinking. <laughs> and there's, there's lots of stuff uh, that's come through. I should say that we've had a bunch of people fell out of that conversation when we had that glitch. 
uh, and I've been trying in the background to get them back on, and they've um, I've not been able to. So we've we've dropped from 150 to 140, sorry, 104 people. Anyway, uh, while that's while I'm in the background trying to sort that out, let me ask you some of the questions that came up. One of the key questions, which always happens, and this will branch on to other questions. Lisa says, can we monitor that someone has completed the learning, completed the course? Can we, can we make sure that someone's actually gone through something and done something? So, of course, that depends on what you're doing exactly. But can you just talk around this idea of completion, Bertrand? How much can we check people have done what we asked them to do? It, it really depends on the technology you're using. If um, you send an email with uh, a, PDF, uh, a PDF file attached to the email, you won't have any possibilities to know if the learner has actually opened the email or not, and if he has read the, the PDF. If you want to know that, you have to not embed uh, the PDF file as, a, as an attached document. You have to put a link to your LMS, which will open the PDF. But then you might have learners which won't be able to open the PDF file just because they don't have the internet in the tube at the moment they click on the link. And if they click on the link, they don't have the internet, they won't click it uh, another time when they have the internet uh, the three or four seconds later. So um, it's really a trade-off between having feedbacks uh, in, uh, in your LMS and uh, making sure that your learners can access your content offline. The other possibility is to have an LMS which has uh, a mobile um, version of it, which would be a proper app that you download and install on your iPhone. And uh, if, you, if you have that, then your mobile app might be able to do some offline content and then later synchronize with the LMS and so on. Okay. But there are not a, a lot of that. But that brings us on to the second question, as I anticipated it would do, which is online and offline. Uh, the two points were raised. One is, well, surely if we want to be sure that we people can access things, then shouldn't we simply, this is Lee Bryant, is it better just do a web-based thing, which can be viewed on different platforms rather than an app? But at the same time, <laughs> Paul Truman's pointing out, look, if you want to do learning when you're not connected to the Internet, then you need to have an app in addition to the standard HTML5 web-enabled content. So that's the perpetual dilemma if you're going to be producing stuff I'm not suggesting there's a simple answer, but Bertrand, what's your thinking as to the choice between web or app for deciding the route to go for delivering to your population? Oh, to be very clear, for the content, focus on HTML, HTML and videos. Um, if you have to have an app, then it would be for, um, for the LMS side so that the, the app could actually download the HTML content and then play it offline. That could uh, th that works. Right. Um, to tell you the truth, um, most of the technology is not there yet. But if you are going to do one mobile content, one app per content, um, it will be much harder for you to deploy the content because everybody will have to install your content before as an app before they can actually uh, open it and so on. <coughs> and um, it will cost so much. I mean, it depends obviously on what kind of content you are doing. But if you are trying to do affordable, uh, uh, rapid content development and so on, uh, forget about the apps. Mm. Well, it's very nice to get a clear answer on that. Will's reaction backs you up on that and says, look, with data bundles becoming more popular and affordable, web base is the way to go. The designing work for multiple standalone learning platforms is not worth it, I think. And that's one of the key issues, is this business of just having trans-platform um, compatibility. It's just a, a complete pain in the neck, even if you're only designing for iOS and Android. Um, but, that, of course, that brings us on to another point, um, is uh, people bringing their own devices or not. And, of course, as we would have expected, that, that came up as a question. Uh, bring your own device uh, is popular. Uh, Tim said the results of his internal survey on mobile usage was that not everybody had a smartphone and not everyone who had one wanted to use it for business-based learning. So uh, the, the bring your own device thing is, is difficult because if we're saying, well, we're going to do it over the web, data charges get involved, are we asking people to use their own phones or do we provide them? 
uh, or are we providing other devices? What's your thoughts, Bertrand? Well, um, to be clear, if you had to do content now, do it so that it can work on the iPad and the iPhone and everywhere. Focus on HTML5. Forget about Flash because Flash is dead, basically. In two years, even on desktop, you won't have Flash anymore. So if for new content, you should focus on technologies that will work everywhere. Now, um, the question here is that uh, at the moment, the technology is not there yet. Uh, it's very hard to produce HTML content that uh, embeds um, animations. It's very hard to uh, do an HTML uh, content which is rich and still compatible with all the devices, especially the, uh, the first iPad 1, actually, which is uh, a pain in the uh, real pain because uh, it doesn't have that much memory. And we, the, the first attempt of building content for the iPad 1 here at Cross Edge uh, actually was very difficult because the Safari uh, st uh, did didn't stop crashing because we, we did put so much JavaScript in it that uh, it just wouldn't work. Mm. So um, I would say that in one year or two years time, the difficulties that we have now will be gone because there will be uh, platforms to develop this content which will be available to us, which will allow us to build new content for HTML5 very easily, and the devices themselves will be so much more powerful that there won't be any uh, more technical issues. So, um, the, the obviously, the next content that we are going to, to build in the next month or so will be HTML5 and will be able to target uh, every devices. The question here is not uh, if you should do HTML5 content or not, the, the, the answer is yes. The question is, did you think about how it's going to be used? And um, where, in which context? And um, if you are going to do content uh, that, that is specifically targeted to iPads or to iPhones, did you really think through how your learners is, are going to, to use it and when? Fair enough. I mean, but uh, no, fair enough. I've got um, more questions coming out. And an observation from Simon that the sun has come out. We're delighted for you, Simon. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I'm now going to uh, push on to a, a slightly different series of questions that came up. The generational issue is one that always raises its head when we talk about learning technology generally, but especially mobile. Um, Michelle Mulligan said that even some of my older students, by which she meant people up to 50s and late 50s and older, and it's a bit sad, I'm in my 50s myself, so apparently I'm an older student, are happy to use their phone uh, and happier to use their phone than the virtual learning uh, environment, which is quite interesting. John was asking whether there is a, a cultural issue. Paul Truman said that he'd done some research, and his research said that the younger the audience, the greater the uptake Connected society users, which is people born after 1990, really take the idea of using a smartphone as standard. So there's, there's a range of opinions and experiences out there. Can, you, can I ask you to share your experiences of, of using mobile across different generations? Um, what is obvious to us is that um, uh, generation-wise in particular, uh, now we are talking about generation C, like the connected people, which are uh, boys and girls who are not even uh, 15, and uh, which are so used to have uh, their mobile phone in their hand all the time. And when we see Google Glasses coming up, uh, we w we know that um, we will have uh, so many devices uh, available to us at all time. And uh, wha wha what we see is that you younger generations are, are just used to, to switch from devices to another, and uh, w whether it is the TV or the smartphone and so on. And they are very comfortable using their smartphone to do everything. Um, and there is a lot of appeal to do uh, things on iPhones and iPads. It's, it's obvious. The question we have to answer is not if we... Um, the, the question is, if we do a content that doesn't work on mobile phone, will we have a drop of usage? Do we need to, uh, to do content on mobile phone to 
find the, the younger generations. What we think here at CrossMage is that we should do both, basically, keep the learning on the desktop and the laptop, and use the smartphones to do something on top of it. Uh, optional content, optional reminders and uh, articles and things, but optional content and um, so that uh, our users uh, can benefit from both worlds, basically. Okay, um, that's, that, that makes sense as an answer to me. Any, any, any other thoughts, please, please come through with, with questions uh, on that. I uh, actually, uh, if, if I may, if I, may as, uh, I saw that there are a lot of questions about tin can as well. There were, please, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it's very true that Tin Can has a has a has a place to uh, as a game to play here because what Tin Can is about is uh, about tracking activities that are done on top of uh, the usual training. Basically, when we used to have Scorm to uh, to track uh, e-learning activities, Tin Can can help tracking things that happen uh, outside the LMS. So you can use TinCan, for, uh, for example, to track the fact that you have uh, read an article on a blog, that you have been to a wiki, like Wikipedia, to, to, to do a few things. Uh, you, you can even use TinCan to say that you have talked to your manager about your uh, training and uh, that you have enjoyed the talk and that you have learned something. So TinCan is a little bit like uh, a Twitter uh, a stream or a Facebook stream, which is uh, to, um, to 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 track basically all these uh, very very small steps of activities that are done outside of the LMS. And I saw that uh, yes, Storyline supports TinCan, but it's not the point. I mean, uh, we shouldn't use TinCan to, um, uh, to 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 do something that SCORM does, basically. TinCan is useful when you start tracking things that you couldn't, that you couldn't track with SCORM before. Yes. So um, TinCan tin can, can be used to actually track things that, have, that are going to be used on your mobile phone. And, and to be very clear about that, you, you raised the analogy with Twitter. When this is not something you have to drive yourself. TinCan uh, can detect and track things that are taking place without you having to, to do any activity at all which enables you to m ensure that things are captured. You don't have to remember to do it. Uh, so Elna is asking, what is Tin Can? Tin Can is the Experience API, which has been called the son of SCORM. It is the, um, the interface for, or the, the methodology and the, and the technology for enabling us to gather uh, information about activity uh, across, theoretically, any form of activity and capture it into one place, which is the learning record store. Uh, is that a fair enough summary, Bertrand? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. L looks like I've learned some things from the webinars we give off. Good. A um, <laughs> couple of questions then coming in uh, on top of uh, other things. Um, and thank you for raising the tin can. That, that was something that would definitely come up. Um, security issue. Leonard said, how do you make sure that things are not to be available over the public domain? How do you make sure that if you're pushing things out to a phone, and let's say you're doing it over HTML5 or an app, let's just bear in mind those two possibilities, but if, you, if you're pushing something out, how do you take care of the security aspects of it? Well, it really depends on what technology you're using. If uh, you send an email, uh, once you've sent the email, you've, <laughs> you've lost the control over what uh, you've put in your email. Uh, if you are using links to, uh, to a platform, then uh, the usual restrictions apply, and uh, it's based on uh, your uh, on your credentials, basically, to uh, to connect to the platform. I, it really depends on what uh, you're do, uh, you're do doing. Obviously, if you start creating Twitter accounts and uh, pushing content over your Twitter account. Um, it uh, will be public to everyone. Now you can publish links to uh, a private platform on Twitter. So uh, if people start following the links, they will have to enter the credentials. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, uh, uh, suppose you wanted a fairly complex piece of learning material to be available to somebody. Uh, if you had that on an app and the iPad was stolen, you could remotely wipe the iPad, in theory at any rate, or you could encrypt it in some way. If you're if people have to get access to a website, the same pertains in the fact that 
surely you, you can encrypt their access to the website. What about stuff that might be stored locally on a device? Is that um, is there an issue with that? It's um, uh, if you have an app, you can always have your app to phone home every now and then. That's how you you deal with security. So basically, when you open the app. Uh, the app will try to connect to uh, the LMS, basically. Mm. And uh, if you are uh, if you are not registered anymore, if you are not enrolled anymore, uh, the app will uh, kindly uh, tell you that uh, you don't have access to the app anymore. So you have to <laughs> yeah. to, to to remove it from your iPad. And if you're not, um, and and web materials will be available, as you say, through login, where you have to provide your credentials. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A rather broader question, also from Leonard came to this question of courses rather than simply materials. Uh, very often we're used to short videos and quizzes and so on, and PDFs being delivered through mobile devices. Leonard asks, do people really want to do formal learning using a smartphone? And I, I would say using any form of portable device. The question is, on a mobile device, how effective can we really be with formal, or should we try to be doing something else? Um, well, I, I think I've answered the question, but you will always have people who uh, who manage to uh, to do things with their smartphone. Yeah. That uh, is very creative, basically, because <laughs> I myself wouldn't uh, spend more than five seconds uh, trying to, uh, <laughs> to to do formal training on a, on, a, on my smartphone. Yeah. But uh, you will find people who will do it. Now the question is, do you want to spend uh, thousands of uh, of pounds uh, doing that? Or do you want to uh, to do something for the rest of the world, basically? And I think uh, I, I think you're right about where you put your energy into things. I suppose what and you're right. You had answered the question before, effectively. What I would say is that there's a point somewhere between the two, whereby you don't have a even a 10-minute formal course, but there is something in the middle where you can give people material, and then let's say you have a quiz at the end. Maybe it's a two-minute video, and then you have a quiz to check whether they've. Uh, picked up on what's available and that's it's not uh, just a resource it is something requiring something a bit more from people so it may be there's something uh, in the middle there yeah yeah definitely what we do <coughs> with our um, uh, with our lms is what we call mi mi micro learning basically and we just send an email with um, the thumbnail of a video and um, every morning when uh, our learners uh, take the tube. They can they, they check their email and they see the the video. They can just open it and it actually opens uh, our LMS. So we have the tracking and so on. Mm -hmm. But it only takes uh, four minutes to to watch the video. So they are done before they arrive there to their destination. And uh, at the end of the video, we can always uh, ask a few questions and things like that. Um, very short activities are always a good candidate to uh, mobile usage. Absolutely. I think this business of being a bit flexible about what we're thinking is, is the way to go. It's not simply you present people with information or you do a full course. What you've just described, short video with some interaction uh, and tracking for a lot of organizations is perfect. Um, coming back to the security issue, Tim, and this is something I was trying to get to, I think Tim was saying, look, our, our IT department has concerns about the impact content has on device performance, e.g. filling up the storage card. And I suppose you could do that, but you could perhaps set the parameters for how big a, a cache would be. And they're also worried about what happens if the phone is lost and anything is stored locally uh, as a downloaded cache. Um, and and it's, it's a fair question, which I hadn't really thought about. Uh, Bertrand, in your experience, is there any way of clearing out a cache remotely or making sure that anything that is stored locally um, is can be accessed? There are ways, but um, I mean, it will cost a lot. And uh, it's... Um, I mean, unless your content is about uh, very strategic and very uh, sensitive issues, which might be, uh, obviously, um, most of the time when you lose your smartphone or when it is uh, robbed, uh, it is actually wiped out uh, half an hour after. And people who rob, uh, who stole the smartphones, usually don't do it to access the content. They do it to, to sell it uh, in the black market. So uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Yeah, it's a, and I take your point. Um, I think that it's a, it would be a, a trump card, though, that some IT departments, particularly in financial services or the military, could pull out. Yes, yes, uh, yes. You know, if there's, if there's any chance of it happening, they'll block it. 
there are ways to do it. There, there are, ways are ways to do it, it. Yeah, but uh, yes, it's uh, it, it costs more. <laughs> I do know the Barclay Card have been using uh, Blackberries for mobile learning of financial compliance, and they're very security concerned, and they've been happy to do it. So yes, there are ways around it. Mm -hmm. um, Claire raises the point about uh, the type of files being used for videos. We can't use YouTube; it takes too much bandwidth. Um, WMV is ICT's preference, but the quality is terrible, and our LMS works in MP4. Do you have any thoughts? You, you raised the point about how important video was, Bertrand. Do you have any thoughts about how, uh, what well, the best formats for videos? Um, yes, unfortunately, it depends on, uh, on on the device. If you are on iOS, which are iPhones and iPad, definitely use HLS. HLS, which is which stands for HTTP Live Streaming, um, which is basically uh, an MP4 file which is cut in uh, very small pieces, and um, and each piece each piece of your MP4 file is encoded several times, one with very very good quality and one with uh, very low quality, basically. So if you are on a low internet connection it will uh, try to download the first piece of your video in high quality, find out that it can't because it just uh, is just not fast enough. So for the next piece, it will take the low quality uh, MP4 bit. So um, obviously it's very hard to produce HLS if you want to do it properly. There are tools on uh, Macs that do it, but if you want to, to do it effectively uh, with uh, not too much pain, you should use tools like Zencoder that we use internally. Sorry, tools like what? Oh, Zencoder, you've, you've Zencoder, been in, thank you, yeah. yeah. Um, which, uh, where you can upload your videos in basically any format and download your video in any format, including uh, Apple HTTP live streaming. And, um, and then uh, you just put the link to your video and it works. The, the only thing is that if you try to open a video in HLS, it just won't work on Andro on Android. So uh, uh, here again, you have to uh, deal with the technology and make some things that uh, if you are in Android or on a desktop, uh, puts you to a uh, different version of the video. And if you are on iOS, uh, gives, you, gives you an H uh, HLS uh, stream, basically. Well, there you are, a complete crash course in uh, video technologies uh, for mobile devices. There's far more than I than I had even considered. Thank you very much, Bertrand. Um, Les, Rory, and Tim, want to thank you for your thoughts in the text chat area on uh, password, protect password protection sandbox areas. And uh, Tim raises the point that only a few mobile learning vendors have really understood uh, the issue of security properly. Um, and Bertrand, this sound hasn't been lost, by the way. I've, I've got two machines here, and you're coming through fine. I think that occasionally we have internet glitches that, that provide issues. Uh, with it. I wanted to raise a question before we get on to um, uh, the, the possible issue of um, apps uh, and how Apple handles them. The cloud. Can I just ask you to look into the future for a moment, Bertrand? What, and this was something that Lorraine brought up, what issue do you think people's habits of using the cloud and the wide availability of content on the cloud will have on the use of mobile devices, or do you think it's um, irrelevant? Ah, Bertrand a dit qu'il avait, il était disconnecté, and he's connecting now. Okay, so in the meantime, uh, I am going to uh, prompt you to say that, um, and we can we can do this now because I can just hide the, um, the slide there. If you have enjoyed the webinar, well, Bertrand will will speak to us when he gets back. If you've enjoyed the webinar, then please do uh, let the world know on using the hashtag hash LSG webinar uh, on Twitter, and oops. And yes, to answer the question which is asked every session, the recording, the slides, the web chat will all be available shortly afterwards at learningandskillsgroup.com. I'm sort of in that area waiting for Bertrand to come back in. Looks like he's not able to get back in. So I'm going to thank Bertrand for his um, for his participation today. It's been uh, it's. <laughs>
<laughs> my phone is gone. Wonderful. Bertrand, uh, it, it's marvellous, though, that your phone did last long enough for you to be able to present. So merci to Bertrand, and thanks also to everyone who has participated on the presentation. I was going to wrap up anyway. It's three minutes to the hour. <laughs> and Will has asked, has someone stolen your phone, Bertrand? And we hope that if someone has stolen it, that you're able to wipe it remotely. Uh, Bertrand, once again, thanks to you, and thanks to everyone who has participated in the session. Great to have your thoughts. Uh, please do go to the website tomorrow or Monday when the uh, information will be available. And, yes, I love the fact that somebody on here is called Great Odin's Raven. Uh, if you are interested in joining us, and I hope you will be, the last webinar of the series is going to be available uh, with you live at uh, 12 o'clock UK time, that's in one hour. Boyd Glover will be talking uh, for the working manager on 702010, talking about not the what and what 702010 stands for, but the why it's important. Really fascinating insight from Boyd, as this has been as well. So once again, thanks to everyone in the chat area for your participation and your contributions. And Bertrand, I hope you can hear me. I'm saying Yes, thanks. I can hear you. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was disconnected. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Bertrand. It's great you're, you come back on. Everyone's saying what a great session it was. Uh, so much, uh, so many thanks to you, Bertrand, for your insight in the beginning and then 